history? Outfit 27 history? Hell yeah. Sure. Is that what we're Why doing? Yeah. Okay. We started Outfit 26. We, we met this morning <laughs> briefly because Maurice is right. We're, we're uh, Outfit 26. <laughs> um, because um, we, uh, we are lucky enough and knock on wood if there's any here. <laughs> Uh, that we are extremely busy and um, and in some ways Outfit 27 actually grew out of um, the, the number of calls I get for work, um, some of it for me, some of it looking for other folks to, to uh, that have my blessing or sound or whatever um, and um, what what kind of grew out of a natural collaboration, we just kind of called it something, and that right now is Outfit 27. We also, uh, all the guys here and many others are also members of our production company called Mirrorball Entertainment. And in some ways, Outfit 27 is kind of the engine that keeps the production company going. Um, because without Outfit 27, taking care of all the methodology of how we work, uh, um, allowing us to be collaborative and have, have a communication that is very creative uh, and, you know, without ego, without, uh, um, you know, judgment other than for the process and for the song itself. Um, you know, Mirrorball would not really be, be able to survive. So Outfit 27 is, uh, um, you know, these group of guys along with uh, five other fellas uh, that are um, writers, artists, engineers, producers. Um, and what we've done is we've put together a methodology so that we can all work in basically the same way. Um, I can go into John's room, plug in a, a, a couple Thunderbolt connectors and my toss link to the D to A uh, uh, or to the DAC and start working immediately. Our systems are set up the same, the way that we save files are set up the same, the way that we name files. All of that sort of stuff is kept the same for the company so that we are able to work smoothly and seamlessly through a collaborative effort as well as so that the people who are selling the music can actually find the files, understand what the code means of how we code them and where we are in that process. Um, that's the sort of basics of what Outfit 27 is and Mirrorball Entertainment. The kind of nuts and bolts of it really is is the people, and um, uh, you know, I've been working with Spider uh, for ten years, twelve, twelve years. Chris, six years. John, three years. So this doesn't obviously happen easily and quickly. It's something that takes time. Chase has been working with us for a couple months. We'll see what happens. You know, that's how it goes. So, uh, but what we'd like to demonstrate today is a little bit about our collaborative effort. Uh, I think as, as we saw here, you guys are all songwriters, producers, uh, ad hoc engineers as needed. Um, and, uh, and you all have to deal with technology and how to figure out what the best technology is for you uh, in an environment where there's lots of stuff to choose from. Obviously, all of our rooms, again, because we want everything to be the same, they all have PMCs. And that's yeah. one of those things that we have to have. So that I can go into any room, these guys know the speakers, they can go into any room they want and know they're gonna get good playback. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I wonder, and this is something that we talk about all the time, your listening environment, how many of you are, have a great and professional listening environment. How many of you are doing it in your house, in your garage, or some other kind of, you know, janky situation? <laughs> so, how many? Right, how many would the, the janky? Yeah, yeah, how many's got the yeah. janky? <laughs> All right, fair enough. How many have the pro setup? 
<laughs> okay, so that's about half and half. That's kind of good. Um, so the, 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 the folks who know, uh, who are, have the more pro setup know that it takes time to get to that point and it takes trial and error. One of the other things that we do at Outfit 27 is we try to help each other figure out what the best system is and all the way to what the best room is for each of our members to be involved in. Um, and we think these are great. Um, we all use a variety of speaker and a variety of playback systems. Um, but we do feel that that really can help you bump up your sound and your and your overall, you know, how you how you uh, how you sound in when you're pitching your music. I'd like to elaborate. On that yeah. Um, because I guess it was six months ago when these two two sixes arrived to the well before they arrived to the world. Um, I had like a ton of outboard gear, like racks of shit that just sat there because I'm in the box and I just sold it all to buy the best speakers that I possibly can afford. And sometimes you might think, oh, I can't afford that, but do you really need four distressors when you're in the box and recording one vocal or the stereo thing? Just stuff to think about. The speakers are kind of the, where the outcome is happening. And, you know, with UAD these days, yeah. you, know, you can do a ton, just you need speakers. So that's the elaboration. Of the yeah. Um, do, do you guys have anything to add to my little Intro. <laughs> <laughs> good intro. Nothing? Was it okay? Yeah, intro? Good intro. Okay. So much for collaboration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, yeah. Chris told me what to say. <laughs> Treat, but also, for the most part, under the umbrella of Apple Twenty Seven, there's really no hard lines between any of those things. You know, we're approaching everything as all of the hats that we wear. Um, and those sensibilities help our clients, specifically with the MNDR project and with giant toy guns. Like we would, we'd work on a mix, and like sometimes it's filling that container with water that exposes the cracks, you know. And, and Peter would, would be like, I got to go down the hall and lay down a new synth line because that just isn't cracking. Now that I hear all the other things and what you guys are doing with the vocals, like I think that it's a really um, forward-thinking and modern approach to just be creative professionals and in, in, in music making, right? Because you know, these days a laptop is as important to the songwriting process as an acoustic guitar once was, right? So the production and pre-production and mixing process are, and sometimes even mastering, um, the, the lines between them are not hard and fast anymore. You know, these guys, have you bring your DAC to Dale to do mastering and yeah. it's like, oh, well that, you're gonna play, now I gotta tweak that. And they don't even print anymore, really. Yeah, it's, it's gonna show up at the session open. It's thinking about, and, and it's, it's always having, I think, the concept in mind of like, what is this song or project, what's the best way to actualize that, right? And, and whatever the execution is, well, whatever, then it is. You know, if that's going down the hall and writing a new bass part, or if that's, you know, muting something just so that something can pop better, that's sort of what we're about. It's, it's, it's wearing all those hats at the same time, but, but letting them kind of inform one another. Electronic track, and I wouldn't do it at 82. If I'm recording like up. strings, I mean, I did a, just did a record where there were strings, horn section, bass, vocals, background vocals, drums. There was like a whole bunch of shit that had a lot of information that I wanted to capture. I also tested my converters; they sound better at 882 mm -hmm. to me. The plugins, like the the DSP, yeah. they just function better there. Just and so, it, and but that was also a record where you know it's it's meant to sound like a band in a room and it's the thing, right? Um, so that was a pro. And again, sort of going from Tony's initial point when we started out talking, what's appropriate? You know, to me that I'm not just doing 88.2 because I'm being a pain in the ass about it, or I like just switching yeah. hard drive yeah. size. To me, that's what's appropriate, and I can hear that resolution, and that's going to get me to the end result on that project. I've definitely recorded things at 44.1 as well, okay. um, but if I'm doing it and I'm producing it, and it's my call, 88.2. I don't know that I would call it transient specifically, but I think that yeah, I think that there's a depth thing. I think that there, I, the best that I can quantify it is that I just feel like there's more information being captured to me, uh, and, that, and and then the sound when I'm putting a mic in front of a drum kit. The sound that I hear in my head that I want to hear when I walk in the control room through the glass is closer at 88.2 than at 44.1. But I'm also doing it through a console and all, you know, there's a whole other thing in this, you know. Honestly, to answer this question really, really br briefly, there's more sonic difference between a microphone being angled this way at a snare and this way at a snare than 44.1 and 88.2. Yeah. You know? yeah. So that's the more important thing. Hell yeah. That's right. The whole point, how we came up with this subgroup was for um, a lot of 
electronic kind of pop music where there's some big builder rides, a whole sections of things that we came up with kind of like, all right, well here's a synth crew. And then all the synths would go and we have a, we have a, like, you know, this filter that kind of just comes up. It already has the frequency and resonance already automated. So we can just be like, all right, chorus is coming or second verse, I want to have the whole thing come down. So I came at it from a different standpoint. And then when we collaborated, we started, you know, combining both aspects of it. Uh, I've started to take the L1s off. So this is a different, uh, an older template. But then we have our effects down here at the bottom. Can you see my those finger? Are all, no, they're all yeah, these are the aux. There's a lot more in we, You know, there's some ideas. And, and you know, you know, Chris just did some mixing and, and I really dug one of the effects he had. And I said, let's get that into the template. Yeah. So as cool things, <laughs> As cool things come up, need to do that. You know, we'll get rid of something that we haven't used in a while and move on. So the, the whole process is pretty fluid, yeah. but we stick to the basics of the template because it works for both our in-the-box setups, which I do both. I have a laptop that I use in the box when I'm traveling or when I'm working in another room. And then I have a full summing analog setup as well. So it works for both. Um, it extends from, from also when you're outputting on um, a summing amp, right, or a summing mixer. Those decisions that are made of what, what things are going to be put together are usually the frequency content and how, like what can be kind of put together and what needs to be separated out. So like you want a vocal to be separate from the bass, or you want someone, to, or maybe strings and keys can kind of mingle together a little bit depending on the song. But these are these are decisions that are, you know, I just want to just elaborate yeah. that these are not arbitrary things. Yeah. We have them split out for sonic reasons. The, at the subgroups, they, they play mm -hmm. multiple roles. Like yeah. John just described like the creative aspect of it, and that's like an outcome of making <clears throat> electro music in the 90s on a mixing console where you've got groups and you've got filters strapped across these yeah. groups and you're doing things like live tape basically. Um, but on the technical side, there's a whole kind of mastering concept yep. where we're using limiters across a lot of different groups and individual tracks so that what, I mean, just to look at it visually, you're like just holding the, the meter in place so that when things are then combined to the master bus, there's not a whole lot of fluctuation and the mastering engineer is able to do a bit more without having things popping in and out just, just because there's some sonic content that's moving. Um, and I know certain members of our team are apprehensive about this practice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've had a lot of success using like a uh, basic limiter like an L1 or Pro L um, from uh, Fat Filter. And, uh, or even like uh, a bit crusher and logic um, or some kind of clipping plugin that's just taking the tops off of those. You know those signals and holding things in place. Yeah, and, and that's all subtly. It's yeah. It's you don't want to actually hear doing anything. And it works best when it's invisible. Um, but doing that, you'll see your master bus kind of pumping in a more predictable, tighter <coughs> way, which works for you know gas. Yeah, are you guys using parallel on anything except drums? Yeah, uh, like every, every, every group, everything. So yeah. what, 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 what's what's special then? If you're parallel compressing everything. It's well, like, uh, not say we yeah. use it on everything, not on every mix. It's not just compression, it's saturation, it's parallel EQ, it's parallel yeah. sensitive stuff. Parallel. Yeah. It just depends on the mix. Uh, we won't put, I, I won't put parallel compression on everything, on every mix. No. Okay. It's, it's just, it's no. just, we use it on everything when we feel we want it. When we need it. Yeah, there's some extent that don't have any parallel. Yeah. yeah. And also the concept of just multing as yeah. well is yeah. done a lot. Like, it's, and that's something I definitely learned from Tony early on. Like, if you're not getting all of the sounds that you want out of this one thing, well, just dupe the shit and make the other one sound like the way you want and then combine the two. And again, as I said yesterday, you gotta be really sensitive about phase relationships if you're doing that. But that's one thing where it's like, well, yeah, we have a doll. You can have almost an unlimited amount of tracks. Why suffer through trying to get, you know, everything automated? Just split it out and then you have the bottom end of your bass and the bite at the same time. So that's another way that things are parallel, but maybe not parallel compression. You really gotta look out for phase. Yeah. Because yeah. the plugins are not all phase accurate. And it yeah. gets really hairy. Yeah. You just gotta have an ear for it. Yeah. 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 Watch, uh, watch Fat Filter's Pro Q tutorial about phase relationships and how they have different phase modes of their EQ. That's a nice overall kind of phase uh, 101. Yeah. It's really good. Really you guys want to you know, start showing off?
<laughs> oh, we like that. They got 45 minutes to make some track, and it has to be a number one record. All right. Well, I believe this is uh, <laughs> this is a mixed kind of thing. So we were going to try to open it up to you know questions and show some differences. I've exactly. never got never got the demo. Which oh, we also play this thing. Yeah, sure. All right, play this thing. Two guys. They did like the guitar, a kick drum, and one little synth thing. And they sent it to me and said, "Here, this is for your artist." And he said, "You I like it, it, John. Make it, make it manly. Make it, <laughs> yeah, make basically, it manly, basically, please." Basically, basically. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your vocal process? Yeah. Uh, John can tell you more about it on this song, and I can tell you what I picked up on from him. He kind of laid this up for me, so it was just a tip in. Um, and I love when that happens, but it doesn't happen all that often. <laughs> um, what it is, don't know where you're from, don't care where you live, let's cut to the chase, I'm not playing games. Clearly, artists does not have great so that proximity was, control. Yeah, that was after his assistant or, you know, whoever recorded it, yeah. cleaned it, tuned it, dealt with it. Yeah. Um, and he added some stuff, and I probably tweaked it from there. Tweaked it, yeah. Usually Tony takes my plugins and cuts like what I did in half. Usually, it's kind of the, the standard. If I have a, well, not on that one. 
That was the room. This was yeah. This was a tougher one than normal. Yeah. I think my don't tell me your name. I don't care That's what it is. Don't know where you're track. from. Don't care so where you live. Let's cut to the chase. I'm not playing games the with answer. your heart, babe. I'll be just fine Gold. if you decline. I'm not going home alone tonight. Make up your mind. Don't waste my time. But really, it might as well be you, babe. Even more EQ. <laughs> don't tell me your name. I don't care what it is. Don't know where you're from. Don't care where you live. Let's cut to the chase. I'm not playing games with your heart, babe. I mean, the processing, again, you know, it, when this gentleman was talking about what sounds good or what's good, it's really, again, appropriate. Yeah. It's what we're looking for. Again, my, my, my only executive guide to the, the production of the song was make it manly. Yeah. And make sure he sounds, I don't know any other way of saying yeah. manly. Yeah. Um, and that was really it. And, and John, Laid it up, like I said. Uh, um, an example of what Tony would do, I had this snare going on. One snare, this one, not 17. And then Tony would do a parallel. Same snare, but just give him a little bit more bottom. And he kind of made that, and PMZ would go some more. It's worth to it, get some bottom into it. So yeah, that's an example. Can you show the kick? Yeah, the kick would, is going to be a little disappointing, probably, because I think, actually, that's more than I usually do. Yeah. Just a dope sample. Just find the right sound. You can't really do a lot with these kick drums. Like all they fall apart. Except the kick drums. Yeah, like the big electro kicks, if you start taking out 500 hertz, just like as you think you're supposed to, it just falls apart. It's going to be a range punch. You know? yeah. The question is more about how you arrange where the compression and EQ is all right. You can press Perfect. before, you yep. pressing yeah. after, and you're yep. moving things around. I think that's really the challenge. Some EQs have an inherent sound, yep. like the soft tube trident A range. Hell yeah. You yeah. throw it on, it just softens. Maybe not what you want to have yeah. happen, so maybe you use it, maybe you don't. Yeah. It's not always the functionality. Some of them are having like an inherent kind of sound. Now. Right. Also, don't be fooled. We're using, particularly in this, I think, um, compressors that, to have an effect that an EQ would also have. Right? Yeah. 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 So that's that's yeah. So how bad. you can also use, you know, just because it doesn't say EQ on it doesn't mean it can't have oh. the same effect. Yeah. yeah. So multi-band compressor. Oh, oh yeah. So not even press not just have an EQ. A compressor, yeah. I mean there's a way, yeah, there's a way to take top off of something with a with a compressor. Yeah. That's not a multi-band compressor. We can do that with a CL1B or Two -tech, like yeah. or We um we saturate a lot with uh, a few guys, a few of our favorites, who's the Studer 800 kind of thing, this decapitator of many, many modes, many, many 10 minute rules passed on that. Saturn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really Saturn's good. I really like the smoke filter with the drive going on. Saturn might not be on this as much, or I might have printed them, but I love Saturn. It's another bad filter thing. Yeah. One of the things that 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 I sort of promote and train people to do all the time is listen on, in, in varying levels on varying sets of playback systems. All the time. Uh, I'll go from loud to work for hours at 25. I think we just had an epiphany the other day. Chris hates my, my setup in my room. And um, <laughs> so he was like, I can't work in here, blah, blah, blah. And, and I was telling him, you've got to listen at a lower lo level. And he spent the whole day listening at a lower level. He was like, God damn, my mix is great. I, can't, I hate it. You know? But, you know, so listening at, lo at varying, you know, different levels is really a benefit. You have to pay attention to that all the time. There's also the, the you used to, 
when when you mix on you know, this this way of mixing has its drawback that it doesn't have an embedded moving around the room. When you had a console, you were moving, you know, channel one to do this and the kick drum. You were moving around the room and hearing things from different perspectives right. and the comb filtering on the desk was changing and your relationship to the music was changing. You were noticing different things. Now right. you're sitting and you're more sedentary and once it, you have to make yourself get up and walk to the back of the room or, you know, text and kind of not pay attention and oh shit, that's way too loud or, you know, right. you have to make yourself proactively put yourself You have to live with the music. Yeah. yeah. In other words, you have to start smoking. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, dissect the bass sound a little bit, like where to come from, plug in. Hardware. Yeah. Before we get there, I want to show a quick Tony Famous. Um, uh, so I have this like thing that we didn't get to in the bridge, but it's like this pitched like sample vocal kind of idea. So he's like, you know, that wasn't manly enough. So he does his famous little lo-fi here. Check this. <laughs> It just gives personality that I didn't even think of doing because he's telling my story. They really love when I put lo fi on high. I hats started doing well. yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. just crazy. Well, it just makes it come out. It's more toughness to the hi hats. And it's, it's so well, you can also create different rhythm structures yeah. Yeah. with lo fi on the hi hat because it clips away oh, yeah. things that, you know, the, the tails of things. Kind of fun. Um, Sorry, I, I the cut bass sound. The bass sound. Oh, the bass sound. So yeah. actually, it was funny because when I was printing this, getting ready for ASCAP uh, yesterday with my assistant, I was like, "What bass did I use on that? That shit sounds hot. I haven't used that in a while." And it was like a massive thing. I haven't used massive in a bit because I don't think it sounds big anymore compared to other things. But let's sound massive. It doesn't sound it's massive. So massive. They need a massive one too, or more massive, or whatever. More massive. Because it's just not. Mass massive. Mass massive. Uh, mass I'm not really sure where the mass sound. Mass mass I don't know which one of these bases is the the massive right now, but we'll just kind of listen. Um, we have a sub bass always. PMCs are good for that. With, with a bit of a side chain. Um, you can see the side chain. Basically just a telephone situation happening. And then I got a real bass, uh, an actual played bass guitar. I think it's an 808. Oh, I call it the 808. Let me find it here for you. And 
And then in the chorus section, it, it alternates <laughs> alternates to a low sub bass from a synth called Ace. So that comes underneath the chord. So it rises with the chord. And then more bass. after you take off the this, L2. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think exactly. that's important as well. It's, it's, this is something, this principle right here, is something that, that programmer producers need to understand. It's they're building a band. Yeah. Even though it's not a band and it's coming out of a box and there's a whole culture behind different ways of creating electronic music. But you're, you're, you're placing characters and a narrative in the same way yeah. that you know a band is. So yeah. when you're choosing sounds, you just you have to choose sounds with heart. Whatever that whatever that thing is, if it's craft work and it's stiff and it's robotic and the point is this is robot music, right. your sounds have to portray that. And there's a you're creating like a little family of sounds and each of those are distinct characters. And what I hear a lot of times is like everything just sounds out of one box. Mm -hmm. And it all right. sounds like it's got one idea behind it instead of these, you know, interlocking, you know, identifiable char characters that have unique, unique characteristics. Yeah, think of the think about in terms of arrangement and, and something sound as selection. mundane as like a sound choice yeah. matters, yeah. you know, and being able to hear the sounds that you're picking. John and I were talking about this the other day because I was writing in Tony's room and I was like, I used one 909 kick because it was the right one rather yeah. than layering three and then EQing and scooping because I could just hear what I was doing. So listening environment, back to that full circle. Listening and environment also, uh, you know, the, 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 your technique as well is going to be important. John has a very particular technique and, and it was funny, Will I Am came into our studio and, and I was like, you know, Will programs and tools as well you guys need to chat, you know, because yeah. it's it's a similar idea of the way that you guys do it. A lot of audio. But I mean, I know J um, Jam and Lewis, they never used a, 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 a sequencer. It was always played. So they had sounds programmed in a sampler, but it was always played live, you know? So it's your technique that creates your character yeah. as well. And that's probably an and actually same thing it. with uh, the Bomb Squad, Public Enemies producers. They would like they um, Shockley would actually have different guys in the crew play certain patterns because right. they just as people had different feels. Nice. So like Flav would do the like fucked up hi hat thing or whatever, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And like Chuck would just be like on the kick on the one and three or whatever, you know. Like different personalities. Like yes, you're playing in the same time, but it's a feel thing. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So yeah. Do we have time for more? Mr. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Let me, let me jump to the back. Yeah. 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 Here's this, I, I, I like your your emphasis on energy, like looking for energy, mm -hmm. in, in, and probably that's part of the answer to the question I'm going to ask. Hmm. Uh, but I was wondering, kind of like on a personal level, what your tastes in music are. Is it fair to say that you guys are you share the same musical taste, uh, or the intersection is really broad, or like I maybe mean, when you're alone, like what do you listen to versus when you alone? You know, what you Are we ever alone? I'm never alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we all have very similar and very different tastes. Right. We yeah, we yeah. share. Uh, we have Spotify playlists that we share with each other yeah. and say, check right, this right, record right. out. Did you hear this record? Yeah. Or this one track off this record that's the odd one out from the artist that like, oh man, it just stands out and it's special. Um, these guys are encyclopedias of no. crazy music. I grew up on jazz music and pop music, oh, right. pretty much only, and then got more into hip hop, which became pop when this guy started mixing it, which made me like yeah. him. Yeah. Um, classical music, I mean, anything with that sounds like music, really. It could be anything but noise music. I'm not really into noise Japanese music. Japanese noise? Yeah, I'm not really into that. No. I think our approaches no. also are different, you know, yeah. even as mixers. Like, I, I think um, John and I have really different approaches to mixing. Right, but we, you know, still have ways that we converge, and I think that it's no coincidence that Tony assembling the team of people. We didn't pick like four of the same yeah, exact people. I don't pick the same people. <laughs> no, I pick different humans. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, it's an important issue. You know, where you're from is is kind of an important issue of of what choices you make. Um, but my my choices move and vary depending on the era that we're in. You know, uh, 
I, for me, it all comes down to rock and roll, and even hip hop. When I was making it more than I do now, to me, was a form of rock and roll mm -hmm. because it was had the rawness that the earlier rock and roll had, but didn't have any more. And it didn't, yeah, like the '90s uh, rock and roll was not interesting to me, whereas the the hip hop was. Yeah, you know, because it was more rock and roll than. than 90s rock and rolls rock in the 90s. It's a lot of acoustic so guitar it, it, in the 90s. I kind of come from yeah. that, and and that's why the manly comments and <laughs> movie stuff like that. But I learn a lot more about electronic music from these guys, you know, and understand it better and what's good about it and what's not, you know, and the better ones and, and the not so good ones. So the thought, the the idea, the sonic, you know, the the sound, where. You know, if, 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 it's, if it's a guitar, what kind of room is it in? What kind of amplifier is it using? What's the, what's the microphone on that amplifier? Is there an amplifier at all? Is it just plugged in? Is it going directly into this box, that box? It's the DNA. Yeah. You know, and that's all in our head because we know we've recorded enough things to know, well, this, this stomp box sounds like this. That stomp box is called a distortion pedal as well, but it sounds like this. So the process is a long, career-long thing, and, and that goes all the way to the cables, you know, which cable. So I'm, whenever I'm thinking about what I want something to sound like, I'm thinking about the microphone, the cables. What, oh, it has a bad cable. Okay, good. I'll throw a lo-fi on and crunch it. You know what I'm saying? That's all part of what, uh, what the sound is in my head. And ideally, it's not something you're, you're imposing an idea on. The, the piece is asking for something. Yeah. Like you have, you're listening and you're listening along and, and there's an implied expectation that arrives and you're saying, okay, now I need to make this deliver what that expectation is. I want to feel this happen here. This isn't, this isn't giving me enough here. This is in the way, that sort of thing. So it's, a, it's you're reacting to things. And then over time, okay, oh yeah, that's working, that's working. And yep. that's how you bounce around with a, different bits. There's a big improvisational, at least for me, aspect to it as well in this moment of discovery, when, when, particularly when mixing, but from production too. Um, when you start pushing on something and it reacts in a certain way, yep. you know, because engineering, you know, you're solving problems, and the, and that's there's a reason why some of the best engineers in the world always do things the same, you know, because there's the only things they can control are these set things, and then everything else is up for grabs, right? Like yeah, making mistakes is a big part of this improv. Oh hell yeah! You hit the wrong button and something happens. Like you have to be, you have to get your ego out of the way and say, oh that's really probably the best thing in the mix, and I hit the wrong button. Yeah. Um, so letting those things live on, if they're if yes. they're worth it, you know, I think that's really important too.